are, I'm excited today. We're starting a brand new sermon series called Scars. Uh, and we're talking about the scars that our, our bodies have, but also our souls and our, uh, sometimes we have emotional scars. Uh, some of those you might be proud of, some of those you might not be proud of, um, but we all have scars. Basically, the premise of this series is that every uh, injury or wound you've ever experienced created a scar. And every scar that you have tells a story. And I think there's value in remembering the stories that our scars tell. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about the scars we bear, but also the scars of Jesus. Today, we're going to focus mo more on the scars Jesus bore and what they mean. And uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about our own scars and, uh, and what they mean as well. Uh, I've got some scars I'll be telling y'all about. Um, I thought about having y'all compare scars during the meet and greet time. I just thought that could get a little weird. Uh, <laughs> knowing a few of you, I uh, wanted to keep it uh, PG, you know. Um, but I, I've got a couple. I've got a, an old uh, sports uh, injury, which is I'm very proud of it um, because it means I used to play sports. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a knee injury from when I played high school football. It wasn't really, uh, you know, varsity level, you might not say, but uh, it, and, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a, a junior varsity either. It was my, my freshman team. My first game of my freshman season, I uh, went out with a devastating knee injury, completely demolished the ligaments in my knee. And uh, my football career was over. But I've got a picture of um, the last uh, time my knee was intact. This is it. Uh, this is the knee here. Now there's huge scars here and here. Uh, but there, it, uh, it's still a little scar there. It must have been from something else. But, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I, I was an athlete, you guys. So that actually happened. But clearly, this injury that took me out of football forever was a blessing in disguise. I mean, this guy was not made for football, right? So... <laughs> Uh, this was meant to be. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I look back at that time, honestly, even though it was painful, even though being on crutches your entire freshman year is not ideal. Uh, I look back on this time fondly for uh, some of the experiences that I had. I had a, a, a really cute 10th grader that was assigned to tutor me and get me through my classes uh, that year. So uh, thank you for Catherine. I appreciate that. And, um, and sometimes, you know, uh, God can bring people to closer together. I remember my dad being really nurturing during that season of my life. Uh, and so that's kind of what this series is about. I asked some of you for your scar stories, and it reminded me just how many stories there are that are present on any given Sunday in this place. It's amazing, all the experiences that we share when we come together. And some of your scar stories uh, are funny. You know, one young woman told me a story about when she was 10 years old and she went trick-or-treating. Uh, she was dressed uh, as an old school, like, prisoner, like, with the stripes, you know, and uh, she tripped on the sidewalk and fell and really just jacked up her shoulder. And uh, she was, like, bleeding profusely through her shoulder, uh, through the shirt, and uh, you could see the blood coming through her prisoner shirt, which she was like, that just made the costume even better. She was like, you, couldn't, you wouldn't believe the amount of sympathy candy you get when you're a 10-year-old girl and you're bleeding while trick-or-treating, you know, she was, uh, she said, every time I see that scar, I laugh about that experience trick-or-treating that year. Some of your scars, of course, seem mundane, but they have stories around them, you know. Some of your scar stories were kind of every day, like uh, somebody wrote to me about the time they had acne as an adolescent and the scars that it left on their face and kind of uh, what resulted from that, the kind of adolescence you have when other kids are mean to you or whatever, you don't feel like you fit in. Uh, somebody wrote a time that, uh, about a time that they had in their appendix taken out as an emergency appendectomy, and uh, it was pretty scary for them. Uh, you know, some of these, uh, some of these scar stories uh, may not stand out. They may not be spectacular, but still um, they mean something. Women who've had children, you know, I, I heard from a woman who has uh, delivered children and she's like, you know, it scars your body and the men who were there at the delivery room are scarred in like a whole different way. Like, you just can't unsee that, you know, like the psychological side of it. The men have the hard part of labor and delivery, obviously. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll edit that out of the video. And uh, <laughs> So, some of your scar stories are funny, some of them are light, some of them, though, are very serious. And this is where it really got real for me this week, was thinking about all that you've been through and the pain that you bring into this room with you on any given Sunday. Now, you personally might not have experienced something dramatic, but 
others around you have. There's a man that goes to church here who has a scar from the time he fell when he was running away from falling buildings on 9-11, near ground zero. There's a young woman here who has scars from when she was addicted to cutting herself. She was addicted to the sensation of cutting because it reminded her that she could feel. And even now in Houston, when it's 90 degrees and humid, she'll cover up her arms with long sleeves to cover the scars. There's a man uh, who goes to church here who has a scar in his mouth from when he was a little kid and his dad was abusive. He got drunk and hit him so hard. He said, when I was a boy, I thought it was never going to stop bleeding, the taste of blood in my mouth. He said, I can still taste it. And he can still feel the scar in his mouth. There's a, there's a woman, he doesn't go to, she doesn't go to church here at the story, but she goes down the hall to our, our mother church, uh, St. Luke's here, and she has a scar on her head, and she came to my office a few months back to tell me about how she got that scar and tell me her life story, and she said that uh, when she was a lot younger, she had a car accident. She was driving, she fell asleep, and four of her children were killed in this car accident. Four children. And she's told that story 10,000 times, but even now when she tells it years later, she weeps. And that's what that scar symbolizes for her. We've all got scars, and every scar tells some kind of a story. And the stories, the cumulative uh, stories of, that your scars tell, that your past tells, it makes up the person that you are today. And what I want us to do for the next three or four Sundays is while looking back at who we have been and the experiences that have made us who we are today, I want us to look forward as well. And I want you personally to think about your own life for a minute and think, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, what do you want your life to be about? What do you want your story to be telling? What, what do you want people to see when they look at you? You understand what I'm, what I'm asking? This is a serious question. What do you hope? I'm, tell, I'm telling you, it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to happen because you choose uh, certain choices that make that happen, right? Intentionally, it will happen that way. Who do you want to be? What story do you want your life to be telling? 5, 10, 15 years from now, this is the question that we're wrestling with this month. Do you want your life story to be one of success? This is a common theme in our context. We all want to be successful. Is that the theme that you want your life story to claim? Do you want your life story to be about wealth? Do you want to be known for being financially wealthy or independent? Do you want your life story to be about family, to have a family that other people envy? Do you want your life story to be about religion? What, whatever that is, I'm just saying that um, it, it's going to happen intentionally. And the story that you live will be that story because of the choices that you make today. Now, um, you can follow along with me in your study guides uh, that, I, that I've given you for this next part. When we talk about the story that your life tells, what we're talking about, and where that starts is with a worldview. Now, let's talk about a worldview for a minute. It's, a, it's kind of a complicated word. Worldview is very simple. Worldview is not your religion necessarily. Your religion might be your worldview, but a worldview can be religious or irreligious. Regardless of whether you're a Bible Belt Christian or a hardcore atheist, you have a worldview. No one has no worldview. It's very simple. A worldview is just your basic orientation in life. It is basically the, the most general and basic assumptions that you have about what's real and what's good, right? So some of our worldviews are religious. We get all of our assumptions about what's real and what's good from a holy book. Some of you have worldviews that are more political. And you, even if you're a Christian, 
your Christianity and what you believe about God is dictated by your politics and not vice versa. Some of you know people like this who are Republican or Democrat before they're Christians, right? And all this matters more than that. Sometimes you can have a political worldview. Some of you have a financial worldview and everything is predicated upon financial gain. Some of us, uh, you know, have uh, di di all different kinds of Worldviews. The most popular worldview in our time, honestly, in a city like Houston, which is so metropolitan and so global and so exciting, Interloop Houston, the most popular worldview is the one that says, you know, it's cool with me if other people have worldviews. I respect everyone's worldview equally, but I don't really claim a worldview. I'm not claimed by any worldview. I'm an independent thinker. I'm an independent person, and I'm just going to be a good person. There's a problem with this approach, of course, in that in th this is the problem. There is a, a lack of reality. There is a, a crisis of reality because you don't have a metric by which to know what's real and what's good. And eventually, the I don't have a worldview worldview becomes one unto itself. And eventually, the person that says, I don't really have a worldview, but everybody else, that's okay if you do, eventually that person's worldview turns in on itself and becomes narcissistic. To the extent that you get to a point in, in your journey where your only metric by which to measure what's good is what's good for you. The only metric by which to measure what's real is what's, what you want to be real. So everyone has a worldview, even people that say they don't. And if you're someone who just sits on the sidelines and says, I don't really claim any particular worldview, I don't anchor or tether myself to anything in particular, there's no foundation that I can say I truly stand on, and you've gotten there out of good intentions because you don't want to be judgmental of other people, I get that, man, that's a good intention. It's well-intentioned, right? But, but I'm telling you that leads no place good. James, who was the brother of Jesus, talked about people like this who tether themselves to nothing. People who constantly just criticize and doubt everyone else's beliefs without having any of their own. He says these people, when the wind blows, they just blow with it. They just toss and turn like a wave on the sea. They don't have any anchor at all. He says this in chapter 1, verse 8 of uh, his letter. He says, the double-minded person is unstable in every way. If you don't have a foundation of reality that you trust, you don't have a foundation of goodness that you live by, then you're going to be unstable in every way um, over time. And it, and it just gets worse. So this is the guy. Some of you might be this guy. I love you. You might be this guy. You just criticize everybody else's beliefs. You condescend everybody else's worldview. You deconstruct everybody else's point of view without ever claiming one of your own. You're the guy who at the beginning of baseball season, when somebody says the Astros are going to the series, you go, no, the Astros aren't going to the series. And then I go, why aren't the Astros going to the series? Who do you got? And you're like, I'm not picking anybody. It's not fair. You can't just take the field, right? You're not even a fan. Like, get you know, be real, like, man up, you know. That, this is the guy that just criticizes everyone else without getting in the game. And really, this is where we are kind of as a culture. We have gotten to a point where really the more doubtful you are, the smarter you seem. And that's not a good thing. The, the more you doubt... Um, the prouder you are of being a doubtful person. And in fact, we're to a place in our culture now where if anyone is sure of anything, if anyone claims to know anything for sure, they're immediately a suspicious person. It's like they must be in a cult or something if they claim to be so sure of something. How can you be so sure of anything? How can you be, have the nerve to contradict someone else's beliefs by being so sure of your own. They're suspicious, right? And some of this is uh, projected onto Christianity in some ways because Christians have been jerks sometimes, online, Facebook, whatever, like Christians haven't represented Jesus well, and so I get it, but really there is a misrepresentation of the Christian worldview by 
secular people and even by some Christians who say that to be a Christian, you have to just put your blinders on and believe things you know aren't true. Because they say faith is blind, right? Have you heard that? You're supposed to have blind faith? You've heard that phrase before, right? That's one of the misconceptions about the Christian worldview is that we are willfully ignorant. When secular people hear blind faith, they hear willful ignorance. They hear otherwise rational people saying and believing irrational things. But look, guys, this is not a Christian worldview. This is not what Christians are supposed to be about. It's not, according to the Christian worldview, a sin to have doubts. Can you say that with me? It's not a sin to have doubts. It's not a sin to have doubts. It's not a sin to have questions about God or religion or your purpose. It's not a sin to have questions. It's a sin to have questions and then do nothing about them. It's a sin to have doubts and then just sit around and let those doubts fester and become toxic until you're one of those cynical people we just talked about, criticizing everyone else's beliefs. It's not a sin to have doubts. Doubts in this way are a little bit like calories. It's not a sin to eat calories. You need calories to stay alive. Do you have any calories last Easter, last weekend, anyone? Chocolate bunnies, peeps? Any peeps in the house? Yeah, I hate peeps. I gotta be honest with you. Uh, I'm more of a chocolate bunny guy or uh, a Cadbury egg guy. I discovered this weekend I like Cadbury eggs. No one knows what's in a Cadbury egg, by the way, but it's delicious. Uh, our worship leader, Johnny, has a theory. He thinks it's just melted down Valentine's candy. Every year they just get what's left, they just melt it down and put it inside those eggs. <laughs> Taste it, you'll, you'll be convinced, right? So, uh, where was I? <laughs> so, calories, right? Um, so, uh, so, it's not a sin to eat calories, but you could say it's a sin to eat too many calories and then just to sit around and do nothing. You take in too many calories and then sit around on the couch watching Netflix, you know, Daredevil on repeat or whatever, then you're going to hate yourself. You're going to be bloated. That's what happens when all you do is doubt and sit around and doubt. You get bloated, spiritually, emotionally bloated, and you wind up hating yourself or hating other people, you know. So doubts, what I'm saying, doubts can be healthy when they inspire a pursuit of truth. Doubts can be good when they inspire in you the pursuit of God or the pursuit of answers. I get emails all the time and sit downs with parents who are just gut-wrenchingly broken about their kid because their kid is in high school or college and their kid has stopped going to church. And it just kills these parents who drag their kids to church every single week their whole lives. And the, the minute they give their kid a choice, he stops going. And they sit me down and they say, how can we get our, our son to come back to church? How do we get him back in church? And they're always surprised when I tell them, first thing I tell them is you gotta stop inviting this kid to church. You gotta stop it. Stop coercing him. He's on to you. You know, like, like stop giving him the impression that you're disappointed in him for not going to church. Stop giving the impression that your love is predicated on his participation in religion because your coercion is pushing him farther away. I tell them, go and buy him a book. And I give him a list. And they're not all Christian books. I say, buy him an atheist book written by an atheist author. And then you read it too and say, I'm going to read it at the same time as you. And when we're both done, let's get a cup of coffee and talk about it. Not in a preachy way, just let's talk about the questions this brings up. You guys, as a church, we have to stop treating young people like they can't think for themselves. God gave them their brains, encouraged them to develop in their thinking. Don't be afraid. And the other thing, and more importantly, is we've got to stop underestimating the ability of the Holy Spirit to walk a young person through a season of doubt. It's okay, parents. It's normal for a kid to go through a season of doubt. In fact, it's almost imperative 
Because after being forced to go to church their whole lives, they need to figure it out. And when the Holy Spirit leads them back to faith, he's so good at it, he'll make them think it was their idea. Which, parents, you know is the only way to get them to do anything in the first place. Let the Holy Spirit handle this. He's done it before. That's why I'm standing here. After my season of darkness and doubt, my atheist season, you know, the Holy Spirit had to lead me back. And only God knows how my mind works and he led me perfectly based on how he made me. The same thing has happened with so many other influential Christian thinkers throughout history going all the way back to Bible times. St. Augustine in the 3rd and 4th century, uh, 4th and 5th century, and, and even later Martin Luther, who we owe so much of the Protestant Reformation to, had seasons of doubt where they weren't even sure if God was real, much less whether they were called to preach the gospel. You know, later uh, we, we had... People like C.S. Lewis doubting the presence of God when his wife got sick and died. And we, we have people like Pope Francis who said there was a time when he wasn't sure. He's the Pope, you guys. Mother Teresa, who everyone reveres. Y'all know the letters that she wrote? They didn't really discover them until after uh, she was dead. But, but she wrote a letter where she said, you know, the part of my heart where God's supposed to be is empty. There is no God in me, Mother Teresa said. Charles Spurgeon, the grandfather of Western preaching, evangelical preacher, hardcore gospel, Bible-thumping preacher, Charles Spurgeon said, I think when a man says, I never doubt, it is quite time for us to doubt him. It is quite time for us to begin to say, ah, poor soul, I'm afraid you're not on the road at all. Don't be afraid of doubts, parents, or if you're the one going through doubts, don't be afraid of the season that you're in. Let your doubts lead you toward more knowledge. And here's why. Here's why. Uh, and this is all based on this misunderstanding that faith means believing in something you wouldn't otherwise believe in unless the Bible told you to, or unless religion told you to. This is based on the misunderstanding that faith is blind, that faith is irrational, faith and reason are two opposite things like you always hear in secular culture. It's based on the misunderstanding from Mark Twain that faith is believing in what you know ain't so. That was Mark Twain's quote. Based on the misunderstanding that, that is pervasive in institutions of higher education right now. Some of you going to college Soon, or if you're in college, you know that in some institutions of higher education, there is an assumption that faith is mutually exclusive with reason that they cannot coexist. A Harvard professor at Harvard University published a, 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 a forceful rebuke of this paragraph in Harvard's sort of program of general education where it says, you know, faith and reason can coexist. He wrote this article in which he just... Uh, just critiqued and tore down that argument. This Harvard professor, uh, Dr. Pinker, said, faith, believing in something without good reasons to do so, has no place in anything but a religious institution. Get it out, he said. Get that faith stuff out of Harvard. How quickly we forget, Dr. Pinker, that Harvard was founded by intellectual Puritans. Christians who got to the new world and were dying for a place to learn about things, secular and sacred. Lest we forget, Harvard was named for Reverend John Harvard, a Christian intellectual preacher who gave 400 books out of his own personal collection to start the Harvard University Library. No thoughtful Christians, no Harvard. How easily we forget how important the intersection is between what we call faith and what we call uh, reason, I suppose. Here's uh, where all this is headed. I'm trying to say that knowledge doesn't threaten faith. Knowledge doesn't threaten faith. Knowledge strengthens faith. Knowledge strengthens faith. Because faith is not belief without knowledge. Faith is the engagement of your will. Faith is acting on that which you know to be true. 
faith is putting into kinetic energy that which you, you perceive in your heart to be true. It is acting on what you know. Our uh, passage today uh, for, from the Bible comes from John chapter 20. And I, I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open it up uh, with me. Or uh, if you don't have a Bible, let us give you one right after the service, right at the, uh, outside at the welcome station. We can get you a Bible. Otherwise, uh, you can use your phone app. You can use your study guide or the screens. John chapter 20 is where we're going to be, verses 19 to 21. And then we'll skip to verse 24 through 29. So we're picking up the story right after the resurrection of Easter, okay? When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. That's, I need to be clear, this is not just all the Jews. These are the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders that was coming at, they were coming after Jesus' disciples. When Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, peace be with you again. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. But Thomas, who was called the twin, another nickname I think Jesus gave his disciples. Some of you remember that from Easter. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the story of uh, Thomas, as we have affectionately come to know as Doubting Thomas. That's all we know about Thomas, is that he doubted once. And he's known as Doubting Thomas for all eternity. How unfair are we to Thomas, man? Would you like to be known for the worst thing you ever did? Like forever, when you get to heaven, would you like them to know you? Like, uh, you know, based on whatever the most awful moment of your life was. I don't think, I don't even want to think what my name would be if I was known for my worst moment. But when we get to heaven and we see Thomas, what are you going to say? Hey, it's Doubting Thomas. And he's going to roll his eyes. And he's, you know, it's like the billionth time he's heard that probably because that's all he's known for. And it's unfortunate because he, Yeah, he had a moment of doubt, but that wasn't all he was about, right? And he wasn't even more of a doubter than the other disciples. He just missed a meeting. Did you catch it? Have you ever missed a meeting and felt like you, you lost out on something? Imagine Thomas. Man, that's a tough meeting to miss. And he missed it. Jesus showed up to all the other disciples, and he's like, here I am, and my scars, and all that stuff. And Thomas wasn't there, So, of course, Thomas is going to be dubious about it. Of course, he's going to be doubtful more so than the other ones. He didn't see with his own eyes. Doubting Thomas is not fair, man. And there's much more to Thomas' story than just this passage. Not saying he's perfect. Thomas actually wasn't so much a doubter as he was a smart aleck, if you really want to know the truth about it. He doesn't have a whole bunch of lines in the Gospels, but when he does open his mouth, he sounds... A little snarky, actually. Uh, Remember how I told y'all the disciples were teenagers? Uh, You ever heard a snarky teenager talk? Thomas has that tone about him. He's got three lines in the Gospels, and every time he finds a way to sound a little sarcastic. The first time is after Lazarus dies. And uh, Jesus hears about Lazarus' death, and he says, I got to go and bring Lazarus back from the grave. And the only problem is that Lazarus lived in a town where just a few days before, Jesus and his disciples had been beaten to a pulp by a bunch of angry priests. Now, if you've never been beaten to a pulp by a bunch of angry priests, 
I can only imagine that would be a terrifying thing to go through. Like uh, just a group of angry priests coming at you sounds really scary. Can you visualize that? That's like a, you know, a Walking Dead scene or something. I don't know, but they, it's just, uh, you're going to have nightmares about it tonight. A roving mob of angry priests with their collars and whatever and robes just coming at you, you know? That's what they had been through in this town where Lazarus was from. And so the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, uh, we respect the fact that you want to bring Lazarus back from the grave, but could you maybe do it, you know, remotely or uh, like you know, via satellite or something. And uh, Jesus is like, you guys don't know what satellites are because uh, they haven't been invented yet. But the, then I think about these things, sorry. And then, and, then, uh, and then Jesus is like, you know, I gotta go because Lazarus has fallen asleep. I gotta go wake him up. And the disciples are like, oh, <laughs> Jesus, this, you may not know how it works on earth, but when somebody falls asleep, they just, they wake up on their own. This literally happens in the passage. It's like, they wake up on their own. He'll probably be okay. He'll, he'll wake up. When people sleep, they wake up, Jesus. You don't have to go and wake them up. You know, it's fine. He'll be fine. And Jesus uh, rolls his eyes and uh, says, okay, I'm going. And y'all can come, or y'all can stay, whatever. And then Thomas, this is literal quote, Thomas looks at the other disciples and says, fine, let's go die with him. <laughs> That's Thomas's response. Now we read it with that boring old British accent, let us go and die with him. That's not what's happening here. This is a teenager going, fine, let's go die with him, I guess. You know, like that kind of thing. And uh, the second time uh, Thomas speaks is during a sermon Jesus is giving. Jesus is mid-sermon. You know, Jesus is going all in with this sermon. It's one of his longest sermons. And uh, it's John 14-ish is where he's preaching this sermon. It goes on for several, you know, pa- verses, maybe a couple chapters. He just preaches and preaches and he's really into it. But Jesus is maybe struggling a little bit through this sermon. He's repeating himself a lot and he's not making sense all the time. If you ever read John 14, you know what I mean. And just kind of, I think it's late at night and Jesus is like, you know, guys, I'm going somewhere and I'm going to go prepare something for you guys. And when I come back, like, I'm going to take you back with me to where I'm going, and you guys know where I'm going, and I'm going to take you there. And Thomas interrupts Jesus' sermon. Jesus' sermon. Thomas interrupts him and says, and I quote, Jesus, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no clue. You've completely lost this, Jesus. I don't know where, where this place is. And, you know, you can hear it with the teenager tone. Remember, all the disciples were teenagers. So, uh, so, so uh, this is who Thomas uh, kind of was in the Gospels. Now, there's a lot that happens between when that happens and when Thomas speaks for the third time. You know, we have Judas's, uh, we have Judas's betrayal and uh, subsequent suicide. We have to remember Judas was not an enemy to these guys. Judas was their friend. They loved Judas. And not only did he, was he disgraced, but he was now gone in the worst possible way. Then we had Jesus' uh, arrest. We had his beating. We had his crucifixion. Just humiliation and pain. Awful things happened to this man they loved so much, and he was gone. And the disciples in this passage really do reflect a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder. They reflect some symptoms of PTSD. I mean, they, they hide away, in, uh, they, they hide away in, in their isolation. They lock doors behind them. They're kind of paranoid about who's coming for them. They are fearful. They're probably having trouble sleeping at night. They don't know what's coming next. And that's where Jesus comes in twice, and he shows them his scars, which is kind of a weird thing to do. Hey, guys, I'm back from the dead. Now check out these cool scars. You know, like, it's kind of weird, but... Uh, It's kind of a guy thing to do too. Guys love comparing scars, you know, and I think this is just Jesus like showing off. Like, look, check out these, you know, like nice knee surgery over there, but look at this, you know, like that kind of thing. But I think there's also something else that Jesus' scars represent and they represent for the disciples his legitimacy. When they see his scars, it occurs to them that he is exactly who he said he was all along. They remember the promises that he made before all this trauma happened. And maybe that trauma had made them temporarily forget his promises, but the scars bring it back to their memory, back to mind. And they realize Jesus is a man who experienced pain and suffering, but he's more than a man. And that the crucifixion wasn't the end of the mission he called them to, but it was the beginning of the real mission. And this 
takes root in their hearts because the moment after Jesus shows them his scars, they leave this room of isolation. They go out and make disciples and change the world like no other group ever has since. A group of nobodies goes out and changes the world forever. And that's why we're here. Even Thomas, good old doubting Thomas, if what we think we know is right, Thomas went all the way to India to plant churches. There's churches still alive today that bear Thomas's name, that give him credit for founding their churches. Uh, and, and Thomas gave his life for this movement. He was martyred in 57 AD by, wouldn't you know it, a roving band of angry priests, actually. <laughs> they put a spear through him because he wouldn't disavow his faith in Jesus. This is the difference a personal encounter with Jesus made for Thomas. Thomas wasn't just a doubter. Thomas needed to experience. This is why I think Thomas is the patron saint of our generation, because we're an experiential generation. We need to know and feel and touch and see with our own senses before we're going to go all in with something. Thomas was the same way. Yeah, he had reservations, but man, when Jesus came to him, everything changed. Thomas went from believing in Jesus toward believing Jesus. And this is the key today, guys. Believing in Jesus, you can do from a distance. Believing in Jesus, you can kind of do casually. Believing Jesus is personal. Believing Jesus is relational. Believing some, someone is different from believing in them. Jesus said, trust me, Thomas, and Thomas said, I believe you. Here's where all this is leading. In terms of your faith in Jesus and the story your life is telling, you can come here every Sunday for years and hear me tell you about Jesus and you can believe in Jesus, and nothing substantial will change about your life. Everything will stay the same. You can read every book they write about Jesus, and nothing will change. You can be religious about Jesus, and really nothing much will change. Because when it comes to faith in Jesus, there is no substitute for personal relationship. There is no substitute for a personal relationship with Jesus. Some of you who are kind of new here, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. Like, I thought this church was supposed to be different. Like, he sounds just like every other preacher I've ever heard. Every preacher always says, what about your personal relationship with Jesus? Look, this is who Jesus is. He comes to be in relationship with us. I understand if for you that me and Jesus stuff just seems so foreign. You walk into church and other people seem like they're close to Jesus and you're fine with that, but you'd rather just keep it casual. You know, other people are like deep in love with him and raising their hands and you're like, well, that's good for them. You know? But let me just get, get through this church service so I can mark it off my list. Um, I'm, I'm telling you uh, with Jesus, there's really no keeping it casual. You might hear people say, well, wow, I felt the presence of Jesus. I heard the voice of Jesus. And you think to yourself, well, that's so nice for them. But I've never really heard the voice of God. I've never really felt the presence like they talk about. I've heard that so many times, you guys. And I got to be honest, I love you. If that's something you say a lot, I love you. But I got to tell you in all honesty, I got to ask you in all sincerity, have you really even tried Have you really even tried to hear the voice of Jesus? Or do you basically fill up every waking moment of every day with some kind of noise, with some kind of distraction? Either because you've grown so hardened and so cynical in your own worldview that you think that's just silliness, or because you're afraid of what you might hear if you tried and just waited. telling you guys, Jesus still speaks. We Christians don't adhere to a holy book. We don't adhere to a religious ritual. 
we adhere to a person. A person who lived and died and lived again and who we believe continues to live and invite you into personal relationship with him. Jesus still speaks. His scars still tell stories. And there's several ways you can know Jesus. There are, as we mentioned earlier, those small groups you can make time for. Or you can go home and watch Netflix. You can make time in the morning, every day, for five minutes of silence and alone time with Jesus. You can worship. You can pray. If you're completely satisfied with how your life is going, and if you've got a five-year plan and it just breaks your heart to think about deviating from that plan, if you really just want a good job and a wife who pretends to like you and you want a couple vacations a year and nice retirement, a couple kids that, you know, bear your name or whatever, and you're satisfied. Listen, don't, don't even listen to the rest of the sermon. Just go ahead and check out, right? But if some small part of you, when you get up in the morning and on your way to work, some small part of you is restless, some small voice in your head ever says, this can't be all there is. If some small part of your soul is not satisfied with the way things are, if you're married and you're just kind of drifting along, two people just drifting in the, in, in, through, through life together because you're not tethered to anything, you're not anchored to anything, and you're just drifting apart until you're so far apart that one of you just gets tired and quits. If you're, if you're single and your whole life revolves around being attractive and accepted, being uh, you know, appealing to the opposite sex, or to other people, your whole life revolves around dating or partying or whatever, and you know it's not enough. If you're a student and all they've ever told you is your only job in life is to make good enough grades to get into a good college, to have a good job so you can make good money, and you know, you know that's not what you're here for because that little voice won't let you forget it. I'm asking you today just to listen to that little voice. Because I think it might be Jesus. It might be the voice of God beckoning you toward your purpose. And saying yes or just heeding that voice. Well, it can change everything. If part of you craves some kind of adventure, some kind of purpose... I'm asking you to engage your will, to act on what that small part of you knows, that you're here for more than just to produce a good salary and have a nice home. If you engage your will, which is faith in Jesus, your life will never be the same. You'll never be bored again. You'll never sit around wondering, what does God want me to do with my life? You'll sit around wondering, how am I going to fit in all this stuff that God wants me to do with my life? Everything will change. If you stop just a minute, turn off the noise, and listen, Jesus still speaks. Next Sunday, we're going to have a baptistry set up over here, one of the big little dunk tanks. If you haven't been baptized, please Let's at least have a conversation this week. If you've been baptized, and it was a long time ago, and you've lived quite a life since then, and you need to recommit yourself to your baptismal vows, let's put a little water on your head so you remember that next week. If you don't want to do that, or if you're not coming back next week or whatever, this can be a personal thing. This really has very little to do with me. This is you and Jesus This is exactly how he wants it. Simply saying yes to him is enough. We go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your calling us and not giving up on us, even when we're cynical and hard-hearted. I'm praying that someone here today makes a decision that changes their life forever. In Jesus' name, amen.